Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Builders vs. Breakers, 10 Online Attacks We Could Have Easily Prevented, hosted by Pluralsight author and security expert Troy Hunt. I'm Dana Gagnon from Pluralsight, and I'd like to take a minute to tell you what to expect in the next hour. First, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat box in your webinar control panel. Troy will be answering questions today, so please feel free to submit your questions through chat during the presentation. I encourage you to follow hashtag Pluralsight Live on Twitter during the webinar. Troy will be sharing some relevant materials and articles on Twitter throughout his presentation. You can also send us questions or feedback using this hashtag. After you exit the webinar, you will be prompted to take a short survey. We'd love to hear from you, so please take a few minutes to complete it. We will also be recording this webinar, so you'll receive a copy of it within the next few days via email. And with that, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Here's Troy. Thanks very much, Dana, and good day, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar today. I'd like to take you through uh, 10 online attacks that we've seen uh, over recent years. And we're going to have a little bit of a look at what made them happen. And I guess with most interest, we're going to have a look at what could have helped us avoid them in the first place. So this uh, webinar is Builders vs. Breakers. Uh, as you know, my name is Troy Hunt. You can find info about me at TroyHunt.com. A lot of what I talk about today uh, is online there. You can grab me on Twitter at Troy Hunt, and as Dana just said, I'm also going to be uh, live tweeting, so I'm going to try and share relevant links as I go along if you do want to get a little bit more info. Uh, and of course, I've got a bunch of courses up on Pluralsight which cover exactly the sort of things uh, that made everything go wrong in these 10 online attacks. So with that, let me jump into it. And where I thought we might start is uh, Bell in Canada and SQL Injection. So Bell, uh, unfortunately, shot to fame in the web application security space a couple of months ago when they had a major incident where their website, unfortunately, had just over 22,000 accounts uh, leaked. And the problem with the accounts being leaked is that the passwords had no cryptography. So no hashing, not even any encryption, everything plain text. And clearly, once it's plain text, it's pretty much game over uh, once your data gets leaked. Now, the interesting thing about the Bell incident as well is that the attackers shared quite a bit of information about how they actually breached the system. And in fact, they shared this screen grab. And what we're looking at here is a Firefox uh, add-on. It's a, a toolbar called Hackbar. And what Hackbar lets you do is it lets you go through and capture requests that the browser is making and then go through and tweak them a little bit. And often we call this fuzzing, just messing around with parameters that get sent to the server so that they can try and get the server to respond in a way that it shouldn't actually do. And in fact, what we can see here is that there's a response in the body of the page that's leaking some information. And this is a very classic SQL injection style attack. So what they're doing, we can see it says conversion failed when converting the nvarchar value. Effectively, they've issued a command to the server that's gone down to the database, it's pulled out the name and the version of the database, it's tried to convert it to an integer, and of course you can't convert Microsoft SQL Server, the string, to an integer, and there's an exception and here it is in the interface. And effectively, they've gone through and pulled 22,000 plus records by doing that. Now the thing about this sort of attack is it's also very, very easily automatable. And that's one of the things that I tend to show a lot of is how you can get tools, tools like Havage or SQL Map, uh, that are so easy to use. I've got a video of my three-year-old using it. Can you copy and paste the URL? Yes, okay, you can mount the SQL injection attack. So let's move on and have a look at what we can learn from Bell. So for each one of these 10 attacks, I'm gonna talk about the attack, and then I'm gonna say, okay, well, here's what we can take away from this, and here's what we can try and do better in the future. So the first thing is, is that SQL injection really is still alarmingly prevalent. In fact, SQL injection remains at the number one position in the OWASP top 10. So for those of you unfamiliar with OWASP, it's the Open Web Application Security Project. And I've actually got three different courses on Pluralsight that explain that at different levels. And OWASP talks about the 10 most prevalent website attacks. And SQL injection has been at number one for a long time. And it's at number one because it is so widespread. It's also extremely easy to exploit. So like I just said, there are automated tools out there. And the impact can be absolutely catastrophic because it is actually disclosing data and it can actually be used to modify data and storage as well. 
So the problem is, as I also said, we've got these tools that make it so easy. If I can teach my three-year-old how to, and I do try to explain to him it's, it's ethical, hacking as well, but for demonstration purposes, if you can show a kid how to copy and paste a link, is it any surprise that it's often kids we see exploiting these risks, and unfortunately it's often kids we see in the news with uh, rather unpleasant sentences as well. Now the thing for us, and I think most of us here are either directly responsible for building software or managing people that build software, or somehow responsible in the process, it really is up to us to understand these risks and learn how to mitigate against them. The mitigations are not hard, particularly for things like SQL injection. It's not hard at all. And many of the frameworks we use today do make it a whole lot easier. One of the things that made it a little bit trickier with Bell is that they were using very old technology. So they're using classic ASP. So you might have seen the .ASP extension in the uh, screen grab just before. And this is from a, it's from a bygone era. It's from an era where we didn't have object relational mappers that automatically parameterized your SQL statements, for example. Everything was rolled by hand. And certainly as we progress, we want to try and move away from these superseded technologies that are no longer being enhanced and really no longer keep up with the attacks of today. So that was Bell and SQL injection. I'd like to move on to something a little bit different this time. And this one is about uh, a journalist called Matt Honan. So Matt Honan was writing for Gizmodo and Wired. And a couple of years back, he had uh, what he refers to as an epic Apple hack. And effectively, it went like this. Now, this has quite a few moving parts, so let me try and explain how everything relates to each other. So Matt had noticed that his iPhone was powering down, and he didn't think too much of it. But then he realized his iPhone had actually been wiped. And what had actually happened is an attacker had called up Amazon. And they'd called up Amazon and they'd authenticated, verbally authenticated themselves as Matt. And all you need to do with Amazon, certainly at the time anyway, was provide a name, an email, and a billing address. And obviously all of this information is pretty easily discovered about most people. So once they were able to do that, what the attack was able to do was add a new credit card to Matt's account. Now that may not sound too bad, adding a credit card to someone's account, but the problem then is that the attacker then called Amazon back a little bit later and said, hey, I've lost access to my account. I'd like you to put a new email address on it. And in order to put a new email address on it, they needed to provide a name, a billing address, and a credit card number. So effectively, through this one channel, over a couple of calls, the attacker was able to change the email address on Matt's account. Now, after that, the attacker could then send a password reset to the new email address. So they could actually go through and reset that password. Now, once they could reset the password, the attacker logged on and retrieved the first, or rather the last, four digits of Matt's legitimate card. You can see how many steps are involved in this, and we're about halfway through. So now the attacker has the last four digits of Matt's card, and the whole Amazon component was just to try and get components of a credit card number. Now, once the attacker had this, they just called up AppleCare and said, hey, I'm having a problem logging onto my Apple account. Here's my name. Here's my billing address. Here's the last four digits of my credit card. And this was all that Apple needed in order to authenticate the attacker. So this then allowed the attacker to get a temporary password from Apple. It then allowed the attacker to get access to the me.com email account of Matt's, which is an email service that Apple hosts, and that email account was used as a secondary account in order to reset the password on his Gmail. So now we've gone from Amazon to Apple to Gmail. So the attacker simply issued a password reset for the Gmail account via the me.com account, and now they have access to the Gmail account. Now, the thing about email is email is like a skeleton key to account. So once you have access to email, you generally have the ability to reset a whole bunch of other accounts. So this then allowed them to reset the Twitter account of Matt. Not only did they reset the Twitter account, they also decided to then remotely wipe his iPhone, 
and also remotely wipe his MacBook because it's so convenient the way all of these things are now leaked or rather linked in so that if something does get compromised or stolen, you can remotely wipe it. But also if an attacker gets access to it, they can remotely wipe it. And that's what happened here. Plus, they also ultimately started making racist tweets from his Twitter, which is never really a good look for anyone, let alone a journalist in the public eye. And apparently, everything was ultimately just about getting access to that Twitter account. But as Matt said, in the space of an hour, his entire digital life was destroyed. So that is a rather serious attack. Now, looking at what we can take away from this, clearly one of the things is that when we have all of these interlinked accounts, it does provide attackers different ways of pivoting and exploiting different assets of an individual which may appear to be unrelated. And we'll see another couple of examples of that later on as well. The other thing is is that the whole sort of thing of different companies viewing the same pieces of data with different levels of criticality. So Amazon, for example, would allow you to simply provide a credit card, put it online, and then pull the last digits back of it and you know, use it for authentication. Now, unfortunately, then Apple obviously also decided that you could use those last four digits for authentication. So, you know, really there's not sort of this view of, hey, maybe even just the last four digits is actually kind of important because it's used as a verification mechanism. One thing that was really missing here as well, and this is another theme that you'll see reoccur today, is no two-factor. Now, of course, all of these do now have two-factor today. So Google, Twitter, and Apple all support two-factor authentication, and they all do it in different ways as well, but it is all there. That clearly would have put a stop to this attack. I'm not saying put two-factor authentication on everything, but the things that are important enough that you want to mitigate the risk of just pure human knowledge going through and compromising it, two-factor is a great tool. The final point here as well is around social engineering. So clearly there was some social engineering involved here, some clever social engineering. And social engineering remains one of the most effective online attacks that we have. So even when our, our actual sort of technology controls are quite strong, social engineering can often be used to circumvent those. And we'll see social engineering come up a few more times in this webinar as well. So the third one I want to talk about is Sammy and his MySpace cross-site scripting worm. Now, one thing you may notice here from the date on this article is it was nearly nine years ago. So this is back in 2005. So it seems a little bit old, but what's important about this event is it was a bit of a watershed moment for cross-site scripting. This was the first time there was a really serious cross-site scripting exploit. Um, and this was also when MySpace still existed, uh, or at least had prominence. And basically what Sammy managed to do is Sammy decided he was lonely and he decided he wanted more friends. So he wrote a cross-site scripting worm that actually got him a million friends in less than a day, which was a rather effective hit rate. And basically what it meant is that any time someone viewed Sammy's profile, this cross-site scripting code was simply executed in the background, automatically added them to his friends list, also left a little message, and Sammy is my hero, which was all very nice. And unfortunately what that then did is it propagated so someone else would view the profile of the infected person and they would get infected as well. So this cross-site scripting bug kept infecting page after page after page. Now this is what it looked like. This was the cross-site scripting attack. And we're not going to go through this today, but I did want to show it just to give an indication of how sophisticated cross-site scripting can be. And again, this was nearly nine years ago. We've certainly moved on in levels of sophistication now. But a lot of people think that cross-site scripting is a pretty basic risk. It can be very serious. So what are we taking away from this? Well, to that previous point, it is pretty serious. It's not just about popping up alert boxes and saying, hey, you've been cross-site scripted. That's often a proof of a cross-site scripting risk, but it is a lot more serious than that. So that's the first thing. Do not underestimate the risk of cross-site scripting. The other thing is, is that again, cross-site scripting is a very well-known risk. It's been up there in the OWASP top 10 for quite some time. 
in 2010 it was in number two position. In the 2013 edition it's in number three. We've actually gotten a little bit better at protecting against cross-site scripting, mainly because of the native defences built into application frameworks. But it is still very serious. Preventing it also remains pretty simple, and it's all about knowing what the risks are. And effectively, it boils down to, are we getting data from our users, untrusted data, that is valid? Or could it possibly be malicious? Can we keep the malicious data out? Often you can, you can't always, which is why we also have this concept of not loading untrusted data into the browser unless it's being encoded. So when it's encoded, it simply means, hey, if an attacker provides us a list of cross-site scripting, we will not actually execute it in the browser. We'll render it in the browser, but we won't actually execute it. And again, particularly that last point is done automatically by a lot of frameworks now. Things like ASP.NET MVC will automatically output in code any strings for the HTML context. So that makes things much better today, but it's still a serious, serious risk. Next one I thought we might look at, and this one does, again, get a little bit uh, interlinked, is HB Gary Federal. And HB Gary Federal was an incident from a few years ago where this organization who provided security services, including to the US government, had, I guess, another epic hacking, hacking. And the way this one sort of proceeded is their CEO, Aaron Barr, was threatening to expose Anonymous. So Aaron decided that he'd figured out who the key players of this sort of amorphous, unknown hacktivist group, Anonymous, were, and he was going to expose them. And he publicly said he would expose them. Now, they weren't too keen on this, so they retaliated by breaking into HB Gary and publishing a whole bunch of emails, defacing their website and destroying a huge amount of data. And the way they did this is interesting as well because it links together things that we've already seen in this webinar. So they started out by exploiting a SQL injection flaw in the content management system of the hbgaryfederal.com website. So a couple of things there. SQL injection, we know it's the number one risk. It's exploited again. It was also a risky proposition because it was a CMS written from hand. It wasn't anything that was sort of well proven and trusted, although certainly there are many risks in those as well. But particularly when developers go and build stuff from scratch, it does require some extra security purview as you're really the only one looking at it. So they had a SQL injection flaw. Now that then allowed the password hashes to be exposed. So one thing that they kind of started to get right a little bit is they had actually hashed passwords. The problem is they were single iterations of MD5 without assault. And what that meant is that the passwords were extremely vulnerable to a brute force attack, like a tool such as a rainbow table, which could go through and just resolve all the passwords to plain text. Now, what they then found when they went and cracked these passwords is that Aaron Barr had a particularly weak password. In fact, it was just half a dozen lowercase letters and a couple of numbers, Kipifo 33. Now, even though they're a security organisation, Aaron had also decided to reuse those passwords in many different places. One of his colleagues, Ted, had done the same thing. So now you've got Aaron and Ted's very simple, weak password stored insufficiently and reused across multiple accounts. So the hacker then uses Ted's credentials to get a shell on an HP Gary machine. But he wasn't a super user, so he couldn't get the same sort of level of access as what he'd really like. But he did manage to exploit an unpatched vulnerability that had been disclosed months earlier, and HP Gary simply hadn't fixed it. So now we have a case of letting your software get out of date and not keeping things patched. So he gets that, and... Once he's got the shell on this machine, he realises that uh, what he'd really like to do is get super user access, so he exploits that vulnerability. That then gives anonymous access to gigabytes and gigabytes of backup data sitting on a machine that was accessible externally. All of that gets published on the pay spins and other places on the web. And we then get moves on and decides that because Aaron was an admin of HB Gary's Google Apps, and because Aaron reused his Kipifo 33 password everywhere, 
the attacker managed to go through and reset the passwords on a whole bunch of different Google Apps email accounts. <laughs> so the whole thing sort of keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And then in one of those emails from another colleague, they find the root password for a machine running another one of HB Gary's websites, rootkit.com, and they then managed to go through and compromise that machine as well. So the whole thing sort of chains. I used the word pivot before. The attacker gets into one place, it gets them information and gets them into another, and then another, and then another. So these sort of things just go on and on and on. Now, I guess the sort of positive side out of this is that the ringleader uh, of the crew that did break into HP Gary at the time, uh, a gentleman often known as Sabu, colloquially known as Sabu, uh, did eventually get arrested by the FBI. He got turned, and he did then help them bring a whole bunch of other uh, hacktivists um, to the FBI's attention. So it didn't work out real well for him. Uh, and that's, uh, I guess, a little bit of a positive story for those of us that are trying to protect websites. Probably a little bit of a cautionary tale to those who are trying to break them as well. A lot of these guys do end up going to prison. So let's have a look at what we can learn by this, because there's a few things here that really stick out. So one of them is that frequently we are chaining these flaws together. And again, I used that word pivot before. So they're pivoting between different risks. And again, these are flaws which we know already. These are not new things. So again, SQL injection, number one in the OWASP top 10. Insufficient cryptographic storage of the credentials. The password hashing was useless. Um, not keeping servers and frameworks up to date and patched. There's a new section of the OWASP Top 10 in 2013 that talks about that specifically. And of course, the other thing is, and this is probably more of a, a social issue, is that the users of the system followed some pretty bad password practices. So very weak passwords and reuse. And these are security, prof uh, security professionals. So clearly that was a serious risk, and you can see how it kind of brought everything undone. And finally, and I think this is an important one to understand about hacktivists as well, hacktivists are not necessarily the most skilled individuals out there. And often they're kids, literally kids, children. But they are very resourceful, they are very persistent, and the other thing about being a kid is that you often have a lot more time on your hands than what many of us probably do. So they are a real threat, and clearly we've seen many, many instances where kids have caused a whole bunch of havoc under the hacktivist banner. So the next one I'd like to look at is Sony. And for those of you that can cast your mind back about three years, it really didn't go well for Sony uh, on a number of fronts. So the Sony PlayStation Network got hacked, and data got stolen. And this happened sort of earlier in 2011, and a lot of time passed, so PlayStation Network went down. Everyone sat around going, well, what's happened? Where's the PlayStation Network? And Sony didn't say anything. They just stayed mum. So everyone speculated, and it got, uh, got quite destructive, I think, reputationally uh, during that time. Now, unfortunately, then they got hacked again, and another 25 million accounts got exposed. Now, this was rather a problem because it already had 77 million accounts uh, impacted. So Sony is now starting to have a huge number of PlayStation Network accounts through multiple attacks exposed. And then to make it even worse, their Sony Pictures website also got attacked. And this was via a SQL injection attack, and it was via the hacktivist group calling themselves LulzSec, who sort of shot to fame in 2011. And the problem there is, again, plain text passwords. Um, they said, look, we've breached a million of them. They released 150,000 publicly. Clearly, this was a major, major problem for Sony because the whole thing just kept happening over and over again. Now, that all begs the question as well. What can we learn out of this Sony attack? And one of the things that is quite apparent in retrospect is that Sony missed the early communication to explain what it was that had actually gone wrong in their network. Everyone sat around and speculated. And we still see this happen a lot. Those who follow me would have seen me tweeting about uh, Boxy, probably about five or six weeks ago. Boxy got hacked. All of the data dumped publicly and no communication. Nobody knew if it was legitimate, if they were impacted, uh, if it was hacktivists copying and pasting another breach and trying to claim credit for it. 
which also often happens. So the vacuum of information and feedback from the organisation can actually be uh, quite destructive. The other thing that we can take away from Sony is that they clearly had an endemic cultural problem. When you get hacked again and again in totally different areas of the organisation, the PlayStation Network versus a Sony Pictures website, there's probably a cultural problem with the way the organisation approaches security. Now, what that says to an attacker is that many of the other assets that the organisation has probably have some pretty low-hanging fruit in terms of easily exploitable vulnerabilities. So we definitely see shortfalls in the culture of application security. So this is the point I'm making here. Attackers will then take that, they'll go to other assets of the organisation, and they'll, they'll have a much higher degree of confidence that they're going to be able to exploit them as well. Now, Sony is also a good one in terms of understanding the cost of attacks because Sony said that it cost them $170 million to overcome those PlayStation Network attacks. Now, remember, some of these attacks were nothing more than simple SQL injection. Number one risk in the OWASP Top 10. We know this, but Sony had to go through $170 million worth of pain in order to actually understand that. Moving on, number six, Gorka, and consequently Asahi Berries, and I'll explain the relationship between those in just a moment. So going back a few years, back to 2010, uh, Gorka Media was hacked. We had a whole bunch of uh, usernames and passwords from staff and customers. About 1.3 million passwords in total uh, were exposed, which uh, clearly is never a good thing. And I think as soon as you start to get into the millions of exposed accounts, it hits a a new sort of level of headline. But what was really interesting with the Gorka situation, they did actually apply some cryptography to the passwords, but it was weak, it was insufficient. What happened after the breach is we started seeing a lot of Asahi Berry spam on Twitter. Now this begs the question, are these two events related? And what was discovered is that because people were using weak passwords that were easily retrieved from the weak cryptographic system that Gorka used, and because they were reusing their passwords, that made it quite easy for the attackers to then go and start spamming on Twitter. It always makes me wonder, though, when we see this, the organisation who's benefiting from the spam, Asahi Berry in this case, I wonder how complicit they are in something like this. Who knows? Anyway, the interesting observation there is that the compromise of one system then led to what is really the compromise of another. It wasn't a vulnerability in Twitter, but Twitter was exploited as a result of Gorka being hacked. So, a few things to take away from this. Now, number one is that not all password hashes are created equal. Now, what we mean by this is that there are multiple ways of implementing password hashes in a database. And clearly, we're doing this so that if the system gets compromised and the stored credentials are exposed, there is another layer of defense. So you have a SQL injection risk, credentials get leaked, we've now got another layer of defense. They're not all credit equal. Many of the schemes that have been out there for a long time are weak. Many of the schemes that weren't too bad a few years ago now suffer from Moore's Law, where computing power has increased so much that they're easy to crack. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, and I think this is really important, when we protect the user's credentials, so when we invite them to register, we store their username and password, we're not just protecting our asset. Implicitly, we are protecting other assets as well. Gorka in some way, was protecting Twitter accounts. And by disclosing those passwords, those weekly stored passwords, they compromise, or certainly played a part in compromising, a whole bunch of Twitter accounts. So think about that the next time you store passwords as well. Also think about it the other way. So when you build an application, what defense do you have to an attacker using someone's stolen credentials? We have a case in Australia at the moment. The government has rolled out a portal. It's called MyGov. And to log onto this portal, all you need is a username, a password, and a secret question, 
which you could easily obtain. You get into this portal and suddenly you have people's medical records, you have their social security payments, you have serious, serious information. The government feels it's sufficient, but it doesn't look at this sort of broader responsibility of, hey, accounts are going to get compromised, attackers are going to get this detail, what defence do you have? And the defence is this one again, two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication saves us from when those credentials are exposed. It's the only thing left once an attacker has the first factor, the information that you know. So two-factor, coming up a lot in this webinar. The next one is Tunisia, and specifically the Tunisian government and Facebook. And this one was from 2011, when there was a lot of political unrest in Tunisia. And effectively what happened here was it was observed that a large number of individuals in Tunisia were having their Facebook accounts hacked. And what was actually happening at the time was Facebook would load the login page over HTTP. Now, a lot of people look at that, even today, not with Facebook today, I'll get to that, but with other services today, and they'll say, hey, it doesn't matter that you load the login page over HTTP because it's posting to HTTPS. So your credentials are encrypted when they're being sent across the network. And they're right. The problem is is that because the login page is loaded over HTTP, it can be manipulated. And in a country like Tunisia, where the government owns the ISPs, so they own all the traffic that goes in and out of the country, they could modify the login page. So they did this. They whacked in a piece of JavaScript. And what it meant is that when someone logged onto Facebook from Tunisia, the submit event of the form would make another asynchronous request and append the username and the password to a URL. And in fact, it was an asynchronous request to Facebook itself, so it almost looked legitimate. But because it was an asynchronous request over HTTP, which had no encryption, then the government could look at that request and they could scrape usernames and passwords. So that was a really, really good example of why HTTPS is about so much more than just posting credentials securely. So what can we take away from the Tunisia situation? Well, the big thing about SSL is it's not about do you or do you not have it. There are degrees of having it and there are degrees of doing it right. And certainly one of the things that OWASP talks about is insufficient transport layer protection. So again, not do you have HTTPS somewhere on your website, but are you actually doing it right? That's the real key. The other thing is that Facebook had other areas of their environment that wasn't doing SSL very well. So they were passing around authentication cookies in the clear. So your auth cookie is when you log in, the website will respond, it will give you a cookie which is meant to be kept secret in your browser and it's that cookie which is sent on subsequent requests that identifies who you are. And this is why you don't need to log on on every single request. Now, because that cookie wasn't flagged as secure, it was sent over HTTP requests. So a guy called Eric Butler decided to create a little Firefox add-on. It's always nice doing your hacks with a Firefox add-on because it's very convenient and user-friendly. Now, unfortunately, what this meant is that you could install this Firefox add-on. You could sit in a cafe with an open Wi-Fi connection, and we've got probably millions of those around the world still today, and you could see everyone else around you who was logged onto Facebook, you'd get a nice little photo and a toolbar, you could click on them and become them. And all of that was because it was insufficient transport layer protection. So yeah, Facebook has fixed this, <laughs> which is good news. Uh, clearly it's not a good look when you can be so easily compromised by a man in the middle, which is the government, or even by a man on the side, which was the case with the cafes, where people were just simply observing traffic that went around them. So everything on Facebook is now SSL, certainly everything in the browser. I have seen a couple of cases, probably within the last year, where mobile apps were still loading components of Facebook over HTTP, but I think that's pretty much gone now. Moving on, DigiNota. Now, DigiNotar is an interesting one. So DigiNotar was a certificate authority in the Netherlands. 
So again, keeping in mind that certificate authorities are these bodies that effectively are responsible for issuing SSL certificates and then forming part of the certificate chain that allows a website to be verified as legitimate when it serves up one of their certs. Now, the problem with DigiNodar is it turned out that attackers had managed to compromise it and issue a whole bunch of certificates for the likes of Google, Skype, Microsoft, and so on. What this means is that if you can get a man in the middle of a connection, even if you've got SSL, if they can serve up a valid certificate, then they can compromise the connection. So unless the user actually looked at the certificate in the browser and said, oh, hang on a moment, I think Google is not meant to be the DigiNota certificate authority, it's meant to be someone else, you wouldn't notice that there was a problem. Either that or certificate pinning, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, what was then observed, and this was particularly happening in Iran, is that a huge number of requests were being sent to DigiNota to check the certificate revocation. And effectively, what it meant is that when the browser was loading the certificate, it was making sure that it hadn't been revoked, and those requests were going to DigiNota when they should have been going to Google's CA or Skype's CA or Microsoft's CA. So that was how they discovered that, look, a lot of this is actually happening in Iran. And theoretically, it was many as, oh, as many as several hundred thousand Iranians. So this was a huge problem in that it really undermined the very fabric of the public key infrastructure that is SSL. If you cannot trust the certificate authority, you cannot trust the certificate, you cannot trust the traffic. This, unfortunately, didn't end very well for DigiNota. Now, they went bankrupt as a result of this. So ultimately, DigiNota is no more. And that caused some pretty serious problems around the world as well because all the DigiNota certificates had to be revoked. And indeed, the certificate authority itself was revoked. And that meant people had to go and get lots of certs and probably made other certificate authorities quite happy. But it wasn't good for the Dutch. So a few things that we can take away from this. So number one, as I said, these guys are sort of underpinning the fabric of SSL on the internet. That's pretty critical. We are seeing SSL compromised at various stages. So there have been other attacks, such as beast and crime. And of course, we all know about Heartbleed, or have heard about Heartbleed, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So we need to be aware that there are times that SSL itself is compromised. And in cases like this, there's not a lot we can do about that. We really couldn't have done much to prevent DigiNota being compromised, at least not as developers when we go back and build applications. There are ways that we can protect against the risk, though. So using things like perfect forward secrecy, where each connection has its own key and the traffic is keyed separately, and the compromise of the key doesn't necessarily lead to the compromise of every single piece of traffic. The other point here, and this probably sounds very obvious and basic, but it is extremely pragmatic. Don't store or transfer what you don't need. If you really don't need to capture someone's date of birth, don't do it. I saw a case recently where there was a data exposure and it had people's religion. That's very sensitive personal information. Don't store it unless you really, really, really need it. Because if you don't store it, you can't lose it. And the final point here, and people often talk about what's the real impact of security incidents on organisations, it can lead to total destruction. Now, DigiNoda is a bit unique insofar as their entire business model is built on the premise of them being a secure organisation. But certainly there are cases where it can bring an organisation down, and even as we saw with Sony, $170 million, even for a company Sony size, $170 million is still a fairly significant whack of cash. So these attacks can have really serious impact. The next one is quite recent. So this was the Twitter at N account. So this is a Twitter account with one letter. I always think it's a little bit like number plates. You know, the really short ones are the really, really valuable ones in countries where you can choose your own number plates. Um, and it's a bit the same with Twitter. Those really, really short ones are very valuable. And I guess if you have an at N instead of an at Troy Hunt, you can get another seven characters in all your tweets as well. Anyway, so what happened was this uh, gentleman had his Twitter at N account stolen. And he had previously been offered up to about $50,000 for this account. So it's a valuable account. 
Now, the first he knew of this was that he got a PayPal message with a one-time validation code. And later on, he also noticed that he had an email from GoDaddy confirming a change in his account settings. Now, he couldn't then log on and verify his credit card data because the attacker had already changed it. So he got this message from GoDaddy. He tried to log on, couldn't log on, tried to call them by phone and verify his identity, couldn't verify his identity because... Their, identi- their identity verification mechanism was dependent on credit cards, and the attackers already changed the credit card. So here's, here's another theme we keep seeing, identity verification using credit cards. So, you know, the thing that you hand over to the, the, wait- the waiter or the waitress every time you go and have a meal somewhere, that's the thing that companies are using to verify your identity before they do things like give you access to your domain or your Apple account. So pretty serious info there. Now, what this then meant is that he couldn't access his GoDaddy account. Now, in GoDaddy, he managed his domains, and he also received his email on one of those domains. Now, this meant that when the attacker compromised his GoDaddy account and had control of his domains, he also had control of the victim's email. Now, fortunately, he'd already changed his Twitter email address so the attacker couldn't actually steal the Twitter email address directly, because, or rather he couldn't steal the Twitter account directly because it was going to a different email, an email that the attacker didn't control. What the attacker then did is held the GoDaddy account for ransom. He said, give me your Twitter account or I will take all your domains and all your data that have a whole bunch of valuable stuff on it. Now the interesting thing here is that GoDaddy basically wouldn't help the victim. They said, well, hang on a second, you're not the registered user. This attacker guy is the registered user. Yeah, because he socially engineered you and he stole the victim's identity. But basically, GoDaddy really wasn't much help, unfortunately. And what it ended up meaning is the victim handed over his valuable Twitter at N account to the attacker, and that was that. And the way the attacker had done this, the attacker claims, and we're yet to see how this happened, but he claimed that he simply called up PayPal and he used some simple engineering, social engineering, to obtain the last four digits of the credit card. So now we've got this interlinked account thing again. Attacker calls up PayPal, tricks the operator into giving them the last four digits of his credit card, calls GoDaddy, gets control of the victim's account. Now here's the final piece that's really, I don't know if I should say funny or scary here, but GoDaddy actually required the last six digits of the credit card for verification. The attacker only had the last four. But GoDaddy allowed the attacker to keep guessing those other two digits until they got them right. And I am guessing that the attacker's guessing wasn't one in a hundred, it was let's get the first one right, so you've got ten chances, you're going to get it right, law of averages and probably half that, and then get the next one. So a real, real sort of serious shortfall on the GoDaddy piece there. Now, the interesting thing, when we look at GoDaddy, even after this, is look at the login page. This is what Facebook used to do. No HTTPS in the address bar, username and password to login. It posts to HTTPS. In fact, I think this is actually an iframe inside an insecure page that actually gets loaded securely. Bottom line is, we're not seeing HTTPS, we're not seeing a padlock. This page is vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack. Now, GoDaddy does actually offer two-factor authentication, which is entirely useless for me because I am not in America. Now, maybe most of GoDaddy's customers are, but most of the world is not. So two-factor authentication is not always equal. And in fairness, I know that the likes of Twitter don't necessarily offer two-factor authentication in every country as well. So 2FA is somewhat still a little bit piecemeal. So a few key lessons here. So same again, we're seeing assets in one resource being compromised by attacks in another, seemingly unrelated. We're also seeing weak human controls. So I guess the thing that really gets me out of this is GoDaddy allowing people to keep guessing what the credit card numbers are. That's not how it's meant to work, guys. That doesn't work very well at all. We're seeing 2FA again. And I know we're seeing this over and over again, but I think it's really important to reinforce how valuable it is because these social engineering attacks are so effective. The other point here as well is that when he did hand over that Twitter account, 
Twitter wasn't particularly helpful in getting it back. And I guess this was part of the problem of having a free social media service. Now, ultimately, the victim did get his account back, but it took a whole bunch of work. And I think we need to remember that when we use the likes of Facebook and Twitter, don't expect to get premium-level support. Don't expect to even be able to get your account back if it gets compromised. So the last one, and it would be a little bit hard to talk about security at the moment without touching on Heartbleed. So I did want to cover Heartbleed, and there's sort of a couple of interesting angles to Heartbleed. And the first one is, uh, it is catastrophic. It's an 11 on the scale of 1 to 10. Millions are at risk. Uh, It will end the internet as we know it. It's it's all very sort of (laughs) Y2K-ish. You know, if you think back, those of you that were building software maybe 15 years ago, the world was going to end from Y2K. Now, of course, it didn't end, and indeed a lot of work went into making sure that it didn't end. But there was a lot of FUD, a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about what it would mean. Now, over time, Heartbleed has not turned out to be quite as catastrophic as we think, certainly not yet, and we're nearly a month into it now. And I guess that's mostly because there's a whole bunch of stuff that's got to happen in order for the Heartbleed risk to be exploited. So the first thing is the website has to be using OpenSSL. It either has to be using OpenSSL or it has to be somewhere in the network pipeline. So, you know, maybe a load balancer or something using SSL, OpenSSL. It also then has to be a vulnerable version of OpenSSL. The site then has to be running SSL. So it could be using OpenSSL, but it's just running everything over HTTP, in which case there won't be a problem. And then, of course, you have to have some useful traffic being sent to the site. Then, the attacker has to try and pull back as much data as they can in 64 kilobyte chunks. That's a lot of requests to get that data. Certainly feasible, and it certainly happens, but it's not an easy thing. It hasn't so far turned out to be as catastrophic as some people would have us believe. Now, the interesting thing about Heartbleed is that many of the mitigations are things that we know quite well. So here's what I think we can take away from Heartbleed. So the first thing is, we may not have seen Heartbleed itself coming, but if we had have done a bunch of these common good security practices, the risk was mitigated. So for example, uh, are we making sure that passwords are unique? And that's as end users. So if my password gets compromised in one website vulnerable to Heartbleed, am I going to start tweeting about Asahi berries or not? And the other thing here, and this is from an app design perspective, making sure that before key activities, you re-authenticate. So most of you would be familiar with before you actually uh, change your password, you need to provide your old password. So that would mean that the attacker had to get your password in that single request that sends it when you log on. So even if they compromised your session in one of the dozens and dozens of requests you make after logging on, they wouldn't be able to change your password and take control of your account, at least not take control away from you. Because sessions were compromised, there's also this point about reducing session timeouts and encouraging logouts. This is one of the things that I talk about a lot in my courses, where we're really saying, okay, there's a bit of a usability impact, but when you leave people logged on for long periods or indefinitely, your window of risk extends significantly. The other thing that happened a lot in the wake of Heartbleed is we saw sessions killed. So the risk was that if Heartbleed was used, your authentication cookie could have been pulled from memory and then used as an attacker to log on as you. Now, if you can kill the sessions after you've patched the Heartbleed bug, then at least if an attacker has grabbed that session ID, they can't do anything with it. But think about whether you actually have the ability to kill a session. A lot of web applications don't. Also, forcing password resets. Do you have the ability to force a password reset? Or are you just storing a username and a password? Regardless of how well you're storing the password, do you have the ability to say, hey, the next time you log on, you're going to have to change it? And just having the ability to communicate with users. We saw communication take a long time in many cases, weeks. I was still getting emails last week. Hey, have you heard about the Heartbleed blog? Yeah, I have. <laughs> it happened two weeks ago. Why are you telling me now? Having a way to communicate early. That was the issue with Sony as well. 
And again, this point about not storing the stuff you don't need. If you don't need it, don't have it. Try and avoid this, well, we'll keep it because you never know when we might want to know uh, what gender someone is. Well, you're probably not going to need to know what gender someone is in most systems, and it is personally identifiable information, sensitive personally identifiable information. So that was Heartbleed. And I have one more slide where I'd just like to summarise a few things and wrap up before we go to some questions. And the first thing I think should be pretty apparent from this is that all of these attacks we've seen, for the most part, use well-known exploits, well-known vulnerabilities. So I mentioned SQL injection, number one in the OS top 10, XSS, number two or three over the last couple of editions. We know about insufficient transport layer protection with SSL, we know about insufficient cryptographic storage for credentials. Other things we covered as well. Things like uh, using frameworks with known vulnerabilities. That was the problem with HP Gary. They had a vulnerable server. We know about all of these things as an industry. This multiplicity of accounts as well, the interconnectedness of the accounts, the ability for attackers to pivot, it gives attackers so many new options. And we need to kind of take a bit of a step back and say, hey, attackers have got new ways of exploiting us using services such as Amazon, PayPal, Gmail. They exploited weaknesses in these services in order to compromise other services. They also exploited humans a lot. Social engineering remains probably the greatest security risk we have. Vulnerable humans. So the question you've got to ask yourself is what defences are you building into your application to protect against the people actually supporting them? And finally, we know all this. And for some reason, we're still building these insecure apps. And to my way of thinking, and certainly based on what I normally see, it's normally because our developers, the guys sitting there writing the code, just simply don't know the risks. Every other day, I see something that is done in code, not because the developer is negligent or has malicious intent, but they've just never been trained. So with that, I would like to wrap up and move on to questions. So Dana, shall I throw to you? Trey, you can go ahead and you'll see in the chat box under questions, there's about 18 questions we've received so far. So if you want to navigate over there, Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm going to try and go from the top and we'll use probably maybe the next 20 minutes. Uh, for other people as well, please uh, use the chat window to start submitting your questions. So from the top, are there any mitigation mechanisms where we can protect our data in interlinked accounts? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, so, you know, one of the obvious ones, again, is two-factor authentication uh, does significantly help if you can ensure that someone has to have whether it be a phone you can SMS or a Google Authenticator app or, or something of that nature, it is going to help circumvent the problem of simply reusing credentials. Think also about other patterns that can be observed in applications. So one of the things that will often happen with interlinked accounts is, is brute force. Uh, we know you've got an account where you use a particular uh, pattern of password. Can the attacker try and keep trying passwords over and over and over again? So looking for brute force protections. Um, a bunch of other sort of similar patterns where there are attack mechanisms that you can identify in code. Uh, and it, uh, particularly in my, uh, there's a course on Pluralsight called uh, Hack Yourself First, How to Go on the Cyber Offense. And I talk about a lot of those patterns there. Uh, so a question from Frank de Groot. Were the Sony sites connected in any way or were they completely separate? So my understanding is that they were separate and certainly the attack vectors were separate. Uh, definitely between the PlayStation Network and SonyPictures.com, they were separate. In fact, I would, without knowing, I would speculate they're probably built by entirely different people, possibly by entirely different vendors. But we do have uh, evidence that the Sony Pictures website was compromised via a SQL injection attack, directly compromised. It doesn't seem to have been pivoted off the PlayStation Network. Uh, so, next question. What is the ideal algorithm that can be used to protect our credentials? So, the main thing here, and it comes back to hashing again, is it, it's a bit of a paradox. So, we want hashing, we want our application to be fast, 
for users to log on, but we want our hashing to be slow. Because what tends to happen, I'll pick a good example, uh, Salted SHA-1, a few years ago, was considered a, a pretty good hashing scheme. A lot of frameworks used it. ASP.NET used it in their membership provider. Salted SHA-1 is too fast because you can recalculate a SHA-1 hash in terms of the number of SHA-1 hashes you can calculate if you use a tool like Hashcat, and again, in my courses, I demo Hashcat, uh, you can calculate about 2 billion hashes a second in the GPU. So you've got to ask yourself from a brute force position, do we really want to allow an attacker to, to do 2,000, oh, sorry, 2 billion um, hashes a second if they get those um, stored ciphers? You know, not really. So the good mechanisms at the moment are normally iterative hashes where rather than being hashed once, it might be hashed 10,000 times. So using things like PBKDF2. Uh, using uh, other hashing algorithms like uh, bcrypt or script where you can define a workload that makes it slower and harder but not make it so slow and so hard that it's going to put undue overhead on your system. And that's always a case-by-case -case, uh, sort of decision. So uh, moving on, what are the better ways? Is there a better way to keep the sensitive data? So I think that's mostly about hashing again. Uh, so again, the, the way we store our passwords. I guess I'll leave you with two algorithms to have a look at. Have a look at script, uh, S-C-R-Y-P-T, and have a look at bcrypt. Uh, both of those are good hashing algorithms. Uh, can you discuss some of the types of 2FA options and the disadvantages of each? So this is a, a good timing because, again, I'm having this discussion um, fairly publicly at the moment in relation to the Australian government's approach uh, to their portal. And when I said in the news that I think that two-factor authentication should be an option, uh, a lot of people say, well, yeah, but that disadvantages people that don't have a phone and can't receive SMSs. Well, you don't have to receive an SMS to do two-factor authentication. Uh, many of you probably use the Google Authenticator app. So I use the Google Authenticator app uh, on my iPhone with uh, no need to be able to receive an SMS, and I use that for my Microsoft account, I use that for my Evernote account. Uh, so that is a, is a really good implementation. There are also soft tokens that can run on the PC, there are also hard tokens, things like RSA tokens, uh, that can uh, just sort of rotate through six digits and when you log in, you have to provide the current set of six digits. So there are different models of different cost. And also platforms like Azure are building in uh, two-factor authentication support so that you can add it to your own apps. Uh, so another question here about password encryption, I think we've covered that. Uh, and let's just be clear that um, do not encrypt your passwords. Hash your passwords. Uh, hashing is not encryption. Hashing is a one-way deterministic algorithm. Encryption is generally asymmetric or symmetric with the whole idea being that you can decrypt. You do not want to decrypt your passwords, certainly not the passwords people use to log into a website. Uh, from Twitter, is there a service or app that will block all traffic over an open Wi-Fi network except for VPN traffic? Um, so that is a good question. I imagine that that would be dependent on the router or the, uh, the ADSL modem if we're talking about a home scenario, and it would be a question of saying what ports and protocols can we whitelist? So you want to probably look at is there a way of just whitelisting um, whatever port and protocol it is that your VPN service is using. That would be a very, very specific case to the VPN and a very specific case to the network infrastructure you're using. Aren't Twitter worried about the fallout of something like this when it hits the news sites? Um, I don't know that Twitter are that worried about it, assuming we're talking about things like Asahi Berries. Um, and Twitter, since that time, so remember that was a few years ago, have added two-factor authentication. And in fact, they have a really nice implementation on, on iOS where it's effectively the Twitter app on iOS that's asking you to authenticate or rather verify your identity. So uh, to be honest, I think something like Twitter, which is so, um, so transient and so popular, is not too worried when someone gets their account owned on another service and tweeted out. I'd be a lot more worried if I was running a business that people were paying for a service and particularly a smaller business um, that, that had some adverse impact uh, beyond just a nasty tweet if someone compromised it. Uh, okay, so what else have we got here? We've got questions. 
What type of attack did Target encounter earlier this year? Yeah, so Target is an interesting one. So Target, for those that don't know, had about 110 million uh, credit cards compromised very late last year, just around the holiday period last year. And one of the most significant things about Target is it is now the largest ever breach of payment card data. Now, that was in December. And incidentally, uh, just before that in October, Adobe was the largest ever breach of online accounts, about 152 million. So just in that sort of uh, you know, couple of month period at the end of last year, we had the largest ever financial breach and the largest ever uh, online account breach. So no, not a great trend security-wise. So from what I understand from Target, and if people want to read more about uh, what happened with Target, go and follow uh, Brian Krebs. He has a blog called Krebs on Security, and he does a great job at analysing what's going on in these events. He also does a great job at tracking down online criminals um, who then do things like send SWAT teams around to his house and other nasty things like that. But he is interesting reading. He goes into it in a lot more detail. But it does seem that some fairly garden variety malware was installed on the POS terminals uh, that Target was using. And there's a lot of speculation about whether that came via one of their, uh, I think it was their facilities management provider that do things like sort of manage the, um, the air conditioning and the car parks and so on at their, at their stores. So that was a pretty serious one. And what's a little bit unique about Target, and, and to be honest, a little bit unique about the US, is the dependency on MagStripe credit cards. So in a lot of other countries, I think um, the EU in general has moved this way, and Australia is just in the process of rolling over as well. It's all now chip and pin. So you've got to have a chip card, you've got to enter a pin. You can't just swipe the card, which appears to be much more vulnerable to these mag stripes being stolen uh, and cards cloned. So there's a lot of uh, legal wranglings going on in the US at the moment about the banks suing Target for not looking after the data, because of course the banks are the ones who have to reissue the cards, and then other people suing the banks because they only provide mag stripes and they haven't rolled over a chip and pin. So it's all gotten very nasty, but the direct answer is it appears to be malware installed on the POS terminals. Uh, so another, I think we've pretty much covered all the password hashing. If people want to read more detail about password hashing, I have a blog post called um, Your Password Hashing Has No Close. And in that blog post, I go through and I show how easy it is to crack salted SHA-1 hashes, and I also talk about other alternatives. So I think we'll probably skip any more password storage stuff for now. Um, so what else do we have here? There's a question here. Do password managers offer some safety? So password managers, uh, I'm a big big uh, advocate of. Um, so I have a, another blog post called uh, The Only Secure Password is the One You Can't Remember. And in there I talk about 1Password. Uh, there is a product called 1Password, the number one and then the word password, made by a company called Agile Bits. So my view on passwords is that everybody pretty much accepts that passwords need to be uh, as long as possible, as random as possible, and unique. And the reality of it is, is that you can't make long, random, unique passwords indefinitely. Uh, for me, and my memory is not great, but it's probably pretty normal, I could probably remember several passwords that we would call strong, but at the moment in my one password, and, and maybe I am a bit exceptional here, I have several hundred different passwords for different sites. So I use one password in a fashion such that every time I need to create a password, I generate something that's dozens of characters, totally random. It gets protected in a strongly encrypted password file, which is the one password um, uh, app. And I have one strong master password that I use to unlock that. Uh, and I go into more detail about the security mechanisms in that blog post, but basically uh, that password file uh, is synchronised to my PC. It's not on a one password website anywhere, and I, I do uh, I do feel that's the best way to do it. There are services like LastPass, which is very good, KeyPass, which are very good, uh, but I would strongly, strongly recommend using a password service as an individual, and as a developer making sure that when you build applications, you're not doing stupid things like, your password must be no longer than 12 characters. Um, you know, make it 50. Uh, every time someone says your password must be 12 characters, someone else turns around and says, well, that probably means they're storing it in plain text in a Varchar 12. <laughs> it's not a good look. Okay, so that was password managers. Uh, let us go on. So what else have we got here? Um, 
Is it possible to build a framework or a language that makes it harder for programmers to do the wrong thing? I think frameworks and languages are doing this. So this comment from Craig Nichols says, uh, such as ASP.NET MVC HTML validation. MVC is a really good example. Uh, and in fact, I go through this. One of my courses is about ASP.NET security secrets. And I talk about uh, web forms and I talk about MVC. And what I like about MVC uh, is there's a lot of secure by default implementations. So, for example, uh, everything is automatically outputting coded when you use either the HTML helpers or, or any Razor syntax. So unless you explicitly say, I want to take this data and I want to put it on the screen and I don't want to output encode it, you'll get output encoding. It's hard to build an XSS bug in MVC. You also get things like uh, anti-forgery token helpers. So there's an HTML helper to create an anti-forgery token and there's a, an attribute that you can decorate your methods with which validates it. So what that means is it's much harder to mount a cross-site request forgery attack. Um, so that is improving a lot. In fact, uh, one of the things that OWASP has recognised is that things like CSRF have actually improved enough that they've downgraded the risk. So just this week, my course on what's new in OWASP for 2013 went live, and one of the points I've made in there is uh, I think CSRF is down from position 5 to position 8, and OWASP believes that is because we as developers are getting better at protecting against it. Uh, so pat on the back for us, uh, also pat on the back for uh, the likes of Microsoft and other frameworks as well, making it easier to do it right. How secure is the ASP.NET membership out of the box? So what we've got to remember with ASP.NET membership is that it's gone through many different versions. And there's always a bit of confusion about it, is it part of the .NET framework or is it just a project template in Visual Studio? The blog post I mentioned just before, uh, our password hashing has no close. I use a brand new Visual Studio 2010 project and I use the ASP.NET membership provider and the uh, uh, SQL provider and that has a single iteration of SHA-1 hash with assault. That is not secure. Uh, most of the speaking events I do these days, I go through and even with my little laptop on stage, show how easy it is just to massively go through and crack passwords extremely quickly. Don't use that. The newer ones are much better. So the newer ones that are in the Visual Studio 2012 and 2013 templates uh, do use, I believe it's a thousand rounds of SHA-256 uh, using uh, PV KDF2, password-based key derivation functions. Uh, so what that means is it should be, because SHA-256 is about twice as slow as well, it should be about 2,000 times harder to crack passwords. So that is a massive difference. Uh, what is the path to become a security expert? Um, try and break stuff without getting into trouble and you will learn a lot. Uh, I, I think in all seriousness, what, what I find about uh, web application security is that it's, I think having a very good understanding of the way the bits and pieces tie in together. So from a, a personal perspective, uh, I am not a, a scratch of a developer on many of the other people out there that understand um, understand object-oriented programming a lot better than I do, understand all sorts of other internal optim um, optim optimizations. But what I think I do well, and I think other security professionals uh, who are quite confident do well, is understanding how HTTP works, understanding how browsers work with JavaScript. Uh, also, probably having a little bit of a subversive mind. <laughs> If you're the kind of person who likes to take things apart as a kid and see what made them work and then put them back together, I think that's, that's probably a good attribute. Um, the other path to becoming a security expert, of course, is to watch my Pluralsight courses. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, there's a lot of training info out there, whether it's Pluralsight, uh, whether it's a lot of other really good online uh, free material. Uh, I think the first path is to start reading up on it. It is a good industry to be in at the moment. Clearly, there's a lot of press about uh, security. Things like Heartbleed, as terrible as they are for, for the general overall security position, are great at building an industry that's good for those of us that want to focus on security. Can you give us one more example of SQL injection and how do I prevent it in code? I'm glad you asked. I have a blog post uh, called Everything You Wanted to Know About SQL Injection But We're Afraid to Ask. Um, so what I would suggest you do is if you go to my blog at troyhump.com there is, um, I think there is a SQL injection tag, 
uh, have a look at that and have a look at that blog post. Uh, the other thing is, is that most of my plurals, well, some of my plural site courses step through it um, step by step by step, and they also show you how to use automated tools to mount a SQL injection attack, uh, like using something like Habbage, um, to mount a SQL injection attack against your own applications. In fact, the, probably the best way to get familiar with this is in my Hack Yourself First course. I created a website that anyone can go and look at now. You don't need to have a full such subscription. If you go to hackyourselffirst.troyhunt.com, you will find that there is uh, a website there that has many, many nasty vulnerabilities that you're uh, more than welcome to go and exploit. So if you want to experience it firsthand, when we finish this presentation, go and search for Havage, H-A-V-I-J, download Havage, and point it at that Hack Yourself First website and you will experience SQL injection in all its glory. Uh, moving on. So, can you give us another example of SQL injection, um, which I think we just covered? How do I prevent SQL injection in code? So, there's three main things to be aware of in terms of preventing SQL injection. So, one is validating untrusted data. So, untrusted data is anything that gets sent to your web application uh, from the... Uh, from an externality, so basically anything that comes in via a query string, a form variable, anything that comes in via a cookie, because attackers can control their own cookies, anything that comes in via a request header. All of those pieces of data, you really want to validate them against a whitelist of allowable values. So for example, if someone is signing up uh, with a phone number, you might say, okay, well look, the phone number has got to conform to a particular pattern, otherwise we're going to reject it. Uh, and I go into a lot more detail in those courses as well as in the blog post on troyhunt.com. So that's one. Number two, and this is the real biggie, is parameterizing SQL statements. So SQL injection happens when you do things like, I'm going to create a, a string in code and it's going to say, uh, select star from widget where ID equals, and then you append a parameter. And you just append it to the string. And then you've got this one long string that looks like a clean SQL statement. The risk there is that that variable, that parameter, uh, can break out of that sort of data context and into the query context. So we have this concept of parameterization, uh, and SQL has these constructs, whether it's in SQL Server or MySQL or other uh, query-based uh, database languages. They have a parameter construct where what you would do is say, select star from widget where ID equals, and then in that string you would say something like at um, ID. And then it has a, a construct around the way the parameter is constructed that allows you to pass the parameter such that it can't break out of the data context. Uh, that's never a really easy thing to explain verbally, so have a look on the website and in the courses. And the third thing is principle of least permission. So do you want to just allow the account that the web application connects to the database with to do something like... Um, uh, let's say, read sensitive personal data? Or should it only be an administrator account? Should you have multiple accounts that your web application connects to the SQL database with depending on the context of the user? So again, that's, that's covered. Um, also on my blog, there is the entire iOS Top 10 series in written form. So I go into detail like this. So have a look on my blog if you want the freebie stuff uh, which talks about this. Or again, it's all explained in the Pluralsight courses. Uh, John, I may have missed it, but are there guidelines in ensuring SSL is done correctly? Uh, so, yes, there is a lot of stuff under the SSL tag uh, on my blog. You could also go to OWASP, and again, just in case that name is not clear, it's O-W-A-S-P, so just Google OWASP. They have a lot of cheat sheets. So they have an SSL cheat sheet, a cross-site scripting cheat sheet, a SQL injection cheat sheet and they talk through these sort of common uh, patterns. So go and have a look at them. But to be honest, here's the best advice I can give anyone about SSL, and it applies mostly to new websites. Just put it everywhere. Don't try and say, well, I'm going to have SSL here, but not there, and there, but not here. It, it just gets extremely messy. And we're at a point now where the overhead of SSL on the compute side, on the server, is very small. Google believes it's less than 1%. They say it's extremely small. 
Uh, the overhead on the network traffic is fairly small once the initial connection is established. There's really not a good reason not to use it. Probably the last reason which is now gone is that AdWords didn't support it until recently. So if you were dependent on actually commercialising your web asset via advertising, um, you don't want to sort of say, well, I'm not going to get any money anymore because AdWords doesn't support SSL. They do support SSL now, uh, so we're really kind of running out of reasons why we shouldn't use it. Uh, another one on password hashing, I'm going to skip that because I think we've covered that. Um, is blocking traffic from specific geographic regions worthwhile if you don't do any business in those regions? That is a good question. That is a very, very case-by-case -case specific question. And it also makes a number of assumptions. Um, assumptions including the fact that inevitably you're going to do this by IP address. Can you reliably identify which IP addresses come from which locations? And we can do it with a certain degree of confidence. But then can you be confident that someone coming through that IP address is actually um, in that location and they're not just simply maybe going out via a Tor exit node or using a VPN service? Uh, so we know, for example, um, uh, in fact, I assume a lot of people on the call are from the US. A lot of other countries, we don't get things like Netflix. But there are a lot of services out there that will provide VPNs so that you can just simply connect through a US-based IP address and go out to Netflix. So it's something that is also easily circumvented. And I think that the question that you want to ask there is probably what's the downside of having people come from other locales and also, what's the downside if you block legitimate traffic? And again, that's case by case. There may actually be a very good reason um, in this person's instance. Uh, another question here. Would it be effective to have a, reput a reputable security firm test vulnerabilities in your software? Yes, <laughs> it would be very effective. I am all for building competency in developers, and I think that that is absolutely essential, and that's the first point. I think also, depending on your asset, and there's a bit of a, a risk-based decision to be made here, you may choose to go out to a security firm and have them uh, test your application in a variety of ways. Uh, so one way you could do this, and in fact you can do this yourselves, is to use some automatic scanning software. So I really like a tool called uh, NetSparker. And NetSparker, there's a free community edition, and if you want to do fancy stuff, you need to pay money. But having a tool like that where you just point it at a URL and say, go nuts, is a great start. That'll pick up a bunch of stuff. It won't pick up everything. That's where you might then go to a security firm and say, look, we want to pay for a penetration test. You will probably pay a lot of money. So just be conscious of that. They're, they're great, they're worthwhile, but they're not necessarily cheap. So I'm conscious of the time, but I'm also conscious we still have... 332 people online and a few questions. So um, uh, unless uh, Dana tells me otherwise, I'm going to keep answering these questions until we run out. I've got the time because it's only 6.20 in the morning here, so <laughs> I'm in no rush. Uh, so we have a question here from James Colin. What testing software do you recommend for testing vulnerabilities? Uh, so I just mentioned NetSparker. I think NetSparker uh, is a great one. There are other great ones as well, but what I like about NetSparker is that it is extremely user-friendly. You copy and paste the URL, and it goes off and it goes nuts. Uh, I ran one just a couple of days ago, and it made a quarter of a million requests to a particular website testing all sorts of different uh, attack vectors. And I've, I just find that as a great automated sanity check. So NetSparker is great. What are suggested ways to protect the website from cross-site scripting other than anti-forgery tokens? Well, the first thing is anti-forgery tokens do not protect a website from cross-site scripting. Uh, anti-forgery tokens protect a website from cross-site uh, request forgery. So the main difference is cross-site scripting, and there are two different uh, classes. So cross-site scripting can be reflective. So you give someone a link, and it has a cross-site scripting attack inside the link. Uh, usually in the cruise stream, and that then gets reflected in the page and it steals cookies or does things like that. Or cross-site scripting can be persistent where it gets stored in the database and then whenever somebody loads a page, uh, that gets reflected into the browser. Now, that is all about basically the entire risk being in that one website uh, and actually executing script in the browser. Cross-site request forgery is more about 
I'm going to have an attacking website somewhere and when an authenticated user on the victim site goes to the attacking website, the attacking website makes a request to the victim's website and it does something under the identity of that authenticated user. So the classic example would be, I go to the attacking website um, and it loads an image from a path with a GET request and that GET request actually performs an action like transfers some money or deletes a, you know, an item from a database. Uh, so anti-forgery tokens are the predominant defense for that. There are other things you can do, and I do talk about it in the courses, so things like uh, referrer checking. So yeah, if you've got a function that transfers money, would you expect the HTTP uh, referrer to be another website? Well, probably not. You might just want to make sure that it's only from this website. But anti-forgery tokens really are the way to do this. Um, Declan, can Troy, famous person, thank you Declan, uh, encourage Agile Bits to add checking for passwords already used when checking new logins? That's a very good point. Uh, idea is to ensure different passwords on all sites. Um, so Declan, I'm going to pass it on to Agile Bits. Um, I know a couple of people there, and just for disclosure, they don't actually give me any free stuff either. <laughs> I just like what they do and I write about it. So I'm going to pass it on. Um, so yeah, good question there Declan. Um, okay, are there any known exploits of 2FA, either technical or social engineering? Uh, so yes, there are. Uh, so a couple of ones come to mind. So RSA uh, did get themselves into a bit of hot water recently uh, where they had uh, an attack on them and I, I believe a number of uh, seed files for RSA tokens were exposed which would have allowed an attacker to recreate uh, the tokens. Uh, plus, of course, uh, an RSA is, is just one of the predominant providers of soft and hard tokens. There, there's been a lot of speculation after the Edward Snowden leaks that RSA is using um, cryptographic random number generators that have been uh, compromised uh, by the NSA. Now, how much of that is uh, fact versus fiction is, is still coming out, but certainly it appears that there have been some unpleasant things uh, happen there. But you know, again, in that case and in the other example we'll give you in a moment, it, it, none of this is meant to be foolproof. In fact, the whole security paradigm is not about trying to be foolproof. It is about trying to raise the bar of difficulty such that you're going to rule out most of the attacks that would have happened otherwise. Uh, if you are the NSA or the Chinese or the Russians or any of these guys, <laughs> probably not the Australians, you really have very deep pockets to be able to break things that you want to. Our goal is to make sure that those pockets have to be as deep as possible. So other attacks against 2FA, there have been documented examples, particularly in Androids, of uh, malware being able to access the generated tokens, um, particularly uh, Android apps that aren't taken through, say, the Google Play Store, uh, tend to have some nasties in them, so there's always that. And then in terms of social engineering, you could always social engineer someone with a token insofar as you might call them up and say, we're from the bank and we're having trouble authenticating you. Can you please pull out your token and give us the number? The, the mitigation there is that all of these tokens uh, are random. They have a very short lifespan. It's normally a lifespan measured in seconds. So it does make things more secure, but not foolproof. Uh, okay, so... So, what else have we got here? Um, so, really interesting talk. Thank you. It's big, big us. Uh, where would you suggest an untrained developer should start learning how to develop secure apps? Uh, look, I, I think, it, and again, I know it's, I keep coming back to this, but probably the, the easiest starting point is if, you are, if security is completely new, and particularly if you're an untrained developer or not someone highly technical, there's a course on Pluralsight that I put out probably about six weeks ago called uh, OWASP Top 10, The Big Picture. Uh, it's a couple of hours long, so it's not too long. Uh, it's not down at a code level. It's purely presentation style, and it talks about each one of these top 10 risks, uh, how they're exploited, and what the defences are. So if you wanted to start somewhere that wasn't sort of really detailed um, and highly technical, that will give you a good overview and then you can either go into other courses that go into a lot of detail about it or, or again, there's a heap of information on the web, including on my blog. But I would start with that overview, that understanding. For non-website use, uh, 
asymmetric encryption is the .NET key generation good enough or should something else be used? Randy, um, <laughs> it, it, look, encryption is always a very tricky one insofar as the biggest problem we have with encryption and one of the reasons that we don't use it for password storage is that you've got to protect keys. So the way keys are generated, and again, keep in mind the comment I just made about RSA, random number generators, and the way they're stored uh, is problematic. With .NET, probably the easiest way to use it is the Data Protection API, uh, DP API, which will then take care of storing the key for you as well. But when we get to the point of stronger generation or stronger storage, you probably start to move into the realm of things like uh, HSMs, hardware security modules. It starts to be it starts to be something that you can't really answer in a short discussion, and it always ends up being expensive. <laughs> so, unfortunately, not not an easy answer there, Randy. Uh, another question here: How much sniffing and spoofing is a threat on overall reported incidents? Um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by that question, but I'll I'll talk in general about sniffing and <coughs> excuse me, sniffing and spoofing. Um, this may be a bit tangential, but I think one thing worth pointing out is that every time you stand up a website, it is often just a matter of hours before you have automated tools that come along uh, and start to try and sniff out various vulnerabilities in the web app. So I always find it quite amusing. I'll create an ASP.NET web application, put it on Azure, and the next day uh, I see all of these 404 requests for admin.php <laughs> or similar. So there are a lot of tools out there that are just indiscriminately going through every asset they can find on the web and looking for common known vulnerabilities. Even when that web application is clearly not built on the platform that the sniffer or the automatic tool is looking for those vulnerabilities in. Uh, in fact, I said this to someone the other day, they said, you know, what makes you think this particular site is going to be at risk? Well, it's on the internet. As soon as it's on the internet, it's a threat. Um, okay, can you speak to the vulnerability of smartphone apps which encrypt local data and share that data? What are the risks related to apps running in the background? So it really differs by phone as well. Um, I'm an iOS user and, and one of the things I like about iOS's model uh, and Microsoft's model is similar in this way and, and probably Android to a lesser extent is that there's very good sandboxing of the apps. So I like the fact that when I take an app from the App Store, the Apple App Store, I've got a pretty good degree of confidence that when that app runs, it's not going to be pulling data from other processes on the same device. Uh, it, it, the only way it's going to do that is if I authorize it and it goes through Apple's APIs. Um, so I, I'm worried about stuff that runs in the background that has not gone through any verification process. So I mentioned before um, vulnerabilities in two-factor authentication apps uh, running on Android, where they might have had um, an exploit that was uh, downloaded from somewhere other than an official channel. So I'd be very cautious about those, but it is a very case-by-case -case discussion. You also see it come up more in jailbroken phones. So iOS out of the box is pretty good. A lot of the vulnerabilities we see that are spoken about in iOS is if you have a jailbroken phone, you may have a problem. A question here about any tools available to test my existing apps for some common vulnerabilities. So uh, I'll give you two answers for that. So number one, again, I, I mentioned things like NetSparker. Number two, the, the course that I have on um, uh, Hack Yourself First, that was sort of the whole context. Learn how to go through and break your own application. So you have a lot of existing assets. What is the process that you would go through in order to look for vulnerabilities in them? And it, again, this is why I have that website hackyourselffirst.troyhunt.com so that you can learn how to go through and find these risks manually. And I would do that in conjunction with a tool like NetSparker. Question here, do you think it is a good idea to log in to different services' websites using Facebook, Google, Twitter authentication? I, I think it, it, it can be. And it's, it's a little bit dependent on the audience and it's a little bit dependent on the class of data. I, I don't know about you guys, but I haven't seen a bank do it yet because banks are obviously very, um, they have a very strong vested interest in protecting their own assets and not creating any dependencies on external parties. So I can understand it doesn't work for them. What I do like about it though is that from a developer's perspective, suddenly I don't have the password problem anymore. 
So I never have to worry if I use, say, Twitter or Facebook in my app for auth, I never have to worry about losing credentials. I never have to worry about what's the right hashing algorithm. I never have to worry about brute force uh, authentication attacks. That makes me quite happy <laughs> to, to have that option. W what I do have to worry about is does that um, A, exclude some of my customers because they don't want to have social media accounts? Uh, they may not want to have a Google account. Uh, so there is a class of user like that. And there's also this problem that it can be confusing. So there was a blog post a few years ago by Rob Connery, um, who created TechPub, um, which has since been bought by Torosite. But when Rob was creating TechPub, he went down the OAuth path, and he ended up removing it because he just had so many problems where people just weren't sure what they should be authenticating with. Hey, I can't get back into your site. Was it my Twitter account or my Facebook account? And I've created this sort of external asset in order to access what it is that I really want to get through to. So it, it can pose a usability barrier. So be conscious of that as well. So getting towards the end here, what's the name of the .NET auth provider you say we should use from now on? Uh, so I, I think probably the way I put it is that if you're going to create credentials, or rather if you're going to store credentials in an ASP.NET application, if you're doing something new, the easiest way is just to start with the newest identi um, identity um, services in .NET. So start with the newest version of Visual Studio, the newest version of the framework, because each edition, they've changed. So again, back in 2010, please don't go and create a new ASP.NET application with Visual Studio 2010 and store credentials. That's uh, you know, almost as good as storing them in plain text. Go and use what's baked into 2012. What's baked into 2013 um, is different again. So just try and grab the latest version or to the, to the previous question, um, use an open ID provider. So there are really good implementations built into the latest Visual Studio 2013 templates uh, that make it very easy to build in authentication using Facebook or Twitter. So that may actually solve your problem in terms of storing credentials. A couple more questions. Sorry for the late question. A recommendation for password, password length for client logins to financial websites. Um, yeah, long. <laughs> as long as you can. So... Uh, Look, my view on it is that inevitably you want to have some sort of length. You don't want people posting, uh, you know, megabytes and megabytes worth of um, uh, password length. Uh, I would probably go and just set it at something like 100. At the end of the day, if you're storing passwords as a hash, what's stored in the database is always the same length. And really what you're coming down to now is, well, how long should a text field and a, and a page be? If, if you set it at 100... No one's ever going to come back and say, oh, these guys are being silly and they're only making it 100 characters. Uh, but don't set it at, at 20 or something like that. There's really not a practical reason unless you're going to then pass that plain text password around and put it somewhere else that's limited in length. <clears throat> the other thing as well on passwords is be conscious about excluding characters. So I keep talking about this Australian government site. There's a whole list of what characters you can use and, of course, inversely, a whole list of characters you can't use. Can't use angle brackets, can't use square braces, can't use curly... You know, we, honestly, there's no reason to exclude that unless there are other... I, I want to say deficiencies, but probably constraints is a better word within the system. Um, and to that extent, uh, in fact, I think I have a blog post on this, surprisingly enough. I would even say, look, if someone wants to put cross-site scripting in their password, then great. A lot of frameworks will block that by default. But in something like ASP.NET MVC, I would decorate my password um, uh, property with a allow HTML attribute so that if someone wants to put cross-site scripting in their password, which will never be displayed anywhere again anyway, go nuts. So, yeah, very long length, don't exclude characters. Does enabling search engaging friendly URLs, say with uh, .hcaccess rewrites, help in any way against XSS or SQL injection? No. <laughs> there's, there's no clear benefit to doing that. All you're really doing is, is rewriting the URL in such a way that the search engine optimization is better, which is good. It's not going to change the fact that the XSS and SQL injection risks both come because of unvalidated uh, user input. 
that XSS uh, reflects data unencoded and that SQL injection doesn't parameterize. So rewriting URLs is not going to change any of that. And I think the last question here is, uh, is email address suited for usernames or should we use other schemes? So it, it's interesting and clearly there is no one consensus about this because there are many websites that uh, only use your email address and there are also many websites that allow you to create a username. That there's probably two things that worry me a little bit with the email address. Uh, one is that email addresses do change over time and do you want to create a model where your username changes over time? And the other thing is, is that there are cases where people share email addresses. Uh, so I've worked in various applications, particularly in emerging markets, uh, countries that are less developed, in environments where um, there are things like uh, doctor's practices where the one email address is used across multiple people. They just have one PC that they share it. You've then got to ask, well, you know, do we want to tie everyone to one account or do we want to have multiple accounts? Of course, that then poses problems in a scenario like that where now you've possibly got the same email address multiple times and that then messes with password resets and things like that. Um, but look, I, I think in most cases we could say that the email address really should be uh, unique. Of course, that poses a disclosure risk and an enumeration risk if you're telling people that you can only register with a unique email address because it implicitly tells them whether the email is already in the system or not. But uh, look, I, I really don't see a massive upside to either route. The only other thing to consider is that if you have a username that is not your email address, you are probably going to want a mechanism for people to retrieve their usernames. So you might end up with a password retrieval mechanism uh, and a username retrieval mechanism. So folks, that was the last uh, question that I have on the list here. We've still got about uh, 250 odd people uh, in the call. So thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, you can find me on troyhunt.com or you can tweet me at Troy Hunt. Uh, and with that, Dana, I might hand back over to you. Great. Thanks, Troy. And that's all the time we have today. Thanks again for attending and for your participation. If you have a question that didn't get answered or comments or feedback, you can send that to us at webinars at pluralsite.com. And as a reminder, we'll be sending you a recording of the presentation in a few days. And remember, as you leave, please fill out our survey. Thanks again, and have a great day.